Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. Of course, this is a monthly book discussion of what is often a classic chess book, and this month is no exception. And as promised last last month, we're going to focus on a very beginner-oriented book. I would guess this is the most beginner-oriented book I have covered in these 20-something chess book recaps, the other possibility being Chess Fundamentals by Capablanca, which, as we mentioned in in that recap, wasn't so fundamental. So I think this is a good one. If you're newer to chess, looking for a book to read, we will be discussing the pros and cons of this book, more pros than cons. Um, Our guest co-host is named Sam Robinson. He is 28 years of age, a Chicago-based chess enthusiast. So let's welcome Sam to the show. Welcome, Sam. Thanks for helping out this month. Hello, hello. Um, Very happy to be on. A long-time listener, uh, happy to be uh, doing one of the the book recaps with you. Yeah, and, and listeners, you should see Sam's setup. He said he came in here looking like a professional podcaster. I wasn't <laughs> expecting it when we logged on. We had done one preliminary chat, but now uh, Sam comes in here looking like Joe Rogan. So <laughs> I'm excited to chat with him. And uh, Sam, could you tell us a little bit more about your chess background? So yeah, uh, my dad taught me how the pieces move on his set uh when I was maybe three or four and I'd play it occasionally uh, when the opportunity arose, but I never thought of it as something that even could be pursued uh, until a friend of mine, uh, we were airing our gripes about competitive online gaming and how toxic it can be. uh, And he suggested that I pursue chess instead. Uh, And I've been in love with chess ever since. it's uh, an incredible hobby and, and passion to pursue and uh, happy to be a part of the chess community. I'm rated about uh, 1,000 and rapid on chess.com, but um, continually improving. I hope to uh, get to about 1,500 by the end of the year, uh, but, but we'll see. Yeah, one step at a time and we'll see what happens. And Sam, before we get on with the book, I'm just curious because it strikes me that you're kind of like, you know, chess.com does a lot of outreach uh, to to the gaming audience, promoting chess as an Mm -hmm. esport. And you coming from a gaming background and being in your 20s, you strike me as sort of like the person they were trying to reach. So and they succeeded. So once you got into chess, like what was next? I know you gravitated towards the chess bras and Yasser. Um, and that's part of the reason we're having this conversation. But what else caught your attention once you were like, all right, I do want to get into this game? Uh, partially the history, uh, like reading about Paul Morphy, uh, like uh, all of that was re- so intriguing. But also that there's so, such a, a deep wealth of knowledge that you can just dive into. And if you're interested in something, you can dive deeper into it uh, and it's simultaneously exploring something you're passionate about and learning and and improving at uh, a craft. It's just uh, an incredible amalgamation of so many things that I'm interested in. Uh, And with the stuff going on with uh, pog champs, or that was what really got me into it, seeing that these people taking lessons could improve so rapidly. Yeah. So there you have it. Like I said, chess and chess.com does a lot of outreach with pog champs and uh, they successfully reached you. And now you've gotten serious enough that you're listening to chess podcasts. So oh yeah, uh, <laughs> much appreciated. Now you picked winning, uh, Play winning chess. I'm going to call mm-hmm. it winning chess strategy like 10 times this podcast. I apologize <laughs> in advance. Of course, Neil Bruce and I already did a recap of Yasser's book, Winning Chess Strategy, from his uh, series. It's a seven book series. Uh, and this was the very first one. Um, so, Sam, why did you think, uh, what resonated with you about play winning chess? Well, when I first got into chess, uh, the main things I was looking into was chess YouTube videos, uh, uh, Gotham chess specifically. Uh, the opening was so interesting to learn about, but I would get to the end of the opening and I just sort of sit there and look at my board and not have any idea what to do. Uh, 
and I reached the end of my prep, I guess you could call it. <laughs> uh, and I, I didn't understand what my plan was. I didn't understand what I needed to do, what I was even looking for to formulate a plan. And upon looking at books, I, I got uh, like a deep dive into the Rui Lupez as my first book. And that did not help me right. at all. <laughs> and I ended up getting this as my second book. And it just sort of struck a chord. Uh, okay. There, there, there's are these things I can look for. That's cool. Yeah. And that's like, again, you were exactly the intended audience. It being like your, your very second uh, book with your first book being a, a bit of a uh, stillborn in terms of like <laughs> yeah. what, what you were going to get from it. So, so yeah, that's, that's good to hear. And obviously I come at it from a different perspective. I, I hadn't read the book before, even though I'm a big fan of chess duels. And as you heard Neil and I say, uh, winning chess strategy, um, I'm pretty favorable on too. So I was coming into it obviously with a lot of chess experience, but I do, I am able to sort of apply a teacher's lens to it because I still you know, obviously for this podcast and for the chess teaching I've done, I'm probably more on top of beginner liter literature than, you know, your your average 2100. Um, so I, I'll give my perspective and I'm happy to hear yours. First, let's just share a few more details about the book. So um, it's, it's by Yasser, of course, legendary grandmaster. Um, and Jeremy Soman gets a they say with Jeremy Soman. So, and it's not entirely clear what his involvement is. I don't suppose you uncovered any scuttlebutt on how that, how that shook out. Did you, Sam? No, I mean, some of the, I've read a book by Soman, the Soman's Complete Endgame Guide, like the first couple sections. And uh, the writing voice is like somewhat similar in places, but it still distinctly feels like Yasser to me, comparing it to the the videos that I've watched. From yeah, I agree. It's distinctly in Yasser's voice. He has a distinctive voice. He's a good writer. Soman, of course, a great writer in his own right. So I'm guessing that they just, Soman probably helped him with the editing and stuff like that and maybe the mm -hmm. structure. Um, but basically, speculation on my part. Uh, so yeah, this book was originally published in 1992. You can get it in a wide variety of formats. Um, you can get it as an actual book. Uh, I think Sam and I both read it on Kindle. And now, of course, Yasser's entire uh, winning chess series is available on Chessable. Am I correct, Sam, that you read it on Kindle? Uh, yeah, Kindle and then the Kindle Cloud Reader on my desktop as well. Okay, yeah. And this is another one where you can also get the Everyman ebook with PGNs. Although, honestly, most people reading this book probably aren't going to know what PGNs are. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I think Chessable... It's probably the best way to read this just because one of my gripes against this book, even the most updated Kindle version, it's a bit outdated at times. And I'm sure that Chessable took care of that. Whereas in the Kindle version, they're still telling you about like analog chess clocks and, you know, <laughs> some some stuff that some stuff, a lot of stuff that's still relevant, but a few parts that they could excise. Yeah, the, the section where he talks about you can even set up a tape recorder with a beep every 10 seconds and use right, that yeah. as a timer. I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting as like a historical relic to, to read it, but mm -hmm. um, probably not the, if you're just looking to optimize your time, uh, it could be cut out. A um, little bit more details about Yasser. I think uh, most of you listening have, you know, know of this legend. Um, of course, he was the U.S. and the world junior champion, U.S. in 1978, world in 1979. He writes in the book, he was the third youngest in history to make Grandmaster when he made it in 1980. Um, Four-time U.S. champion, peaked at number 10 in the world. Of course, he's a prolific author. Um best known as a St. Louis and St. Louis chess club and sometimes chess bra commentator, always entertaining, full of stories. Um, so is, is Yasser, like once you sort of dove into the online sphere, I gather that you quickly came to like Yasser, Sam. Yeah. His enthusiasm is so infectious. Um, some chess YouTube content can be a, a grind to get through, but Yasser, you can't, there's not enough Yasser content out there to uh consume in terms of videos i just yeah, eat it up yeah and he's got just like infinite stories and listeners please don't email me telling me to get him on the show i've tried <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I hope to someday but uh but the ball's not in my court um now I'm, i did want to leave read a little quote he shared about his bio his biography uh he writes i was born in damascus in 1960 my father is syrian and my mother english 
When I was two years old, we moved to England in 1967. We moved again, this time to the United States. We settled first in Seattle, Washington, then moved to the warmer climate of Virginia Beach, Virginia, finally settled back in Seattle in 1972. While in Virginia, I got used to playing sports on fine sunny days. The typical cold and rainy days of Seattle made me stir crazy. When a neighbor offered to teach me chess, I jumped at the chance, anything to relieve the boredom of those long, wet evenings. So pretty amazing. He started at 12. Obviously, that doesn't happen very often in these days. And he goes on to talk about playing at this legendary coffee house in Seattle called, I think, Last Exit uh, in Brooklyn um, and, you know, played with some of the uh, the Seattle area regulars, masters like Victor's Popels and others. Uh, I know that John Donaldson's from the area and they eventually became friends. Um, but yeah, he's got a decent amount of biography sprinkled in. But yeah, obviously total legend and, you know, the best player representing the U.S. for many, many years. Now, before we really get deeper into the book, um, one thing we should generally discuss is just sort of what rating might find this book useful. Um, so Sam's already given us some insight on this. If you're brand new to chess, it's a good fit. Uh, Sam, do you have a sense, like, as he got to the more advanced concepts, did you feel like they were right in your wheelhouse? You understood them? Did you feel like they were a little over your head, way over your head? Where, where was it coming in? So I originally picked up this book about a year and a half ago. Uh, and back then I would say I was rated maybe 600 or 500 in rapid on chess.com. And there were definitely some things that went over my head. Um, even playing out the sample games on the board, uh, I wasn't really sure what I was supposed to be getting out of it at times. Uh, but I going back and rereading it to prepare for the podcast, uh, I got a lot out of it. Uh, especially with the sample games that he chose. So I would recommend it to anybody uh, near my level. Uh, once again, I'm rated a, about a thousand. So I'd recommend it to anybody 1200 or below. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. And there'd be one or two concepts that would be helpful even for a 1200. And of course it starts with, it, it assumes no knowledge. It starts to, with telling you how the pieces move. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a good first chess book. Um, for Sam, it's as he's been saying, it hit the spot. Uh, as as a teacher, I might have one or two books that I would rank ahead of this, which I will reveal in time. But to me, it's certainly a solid choice. Um, so we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors, and then we're going to discuss, sort of share what the chapters and the thesis of the book is. And then we're going to dig in and share some of our favorite quotes and stories of which there were plenty. So we will be right back. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com, the leading chess education platform. Chessable, of course, uses its proprietary move trainer technology, which has space repetition to help you learn opening sequences, tactical patterns, basic end games, all of which it will quiz you on repeatedly until you have it down cold. They have courses both for free and for purchase. One of their newest includes the Beginner's 1D4 Repertoire by popular and entertaining YouTube commentator and streamer. I am Andres Toth. So if you're just looking to get your feet wet in an opening, it is a great uh, intro. And of course, they also have intermediate classics like Endgame Strategy and tons of advanced opening courses that you can check out for free or for purchase at chessable.com. And we are back. So the book is... Uh, broken up into seven chapters. They are the evolution of chess, the first principle, force, the second principle, time, the third principle, space, the fourth principle, pawn structure. Those are sort of the, the four principles that Yasser patents, air quotes, and you know describes as what he considers to be the things one should know about. And then chapter six is annotated games, and the final chapter is the four principles and you. Um, so we might as well just get into it, Sam, because one of my quibbles is sort of the, the the construct of these four principles. But did you find this like when when those were presented to you and he does have good explanations of those principles, which we will get into shortly. But did, did that resonate with you when you read it? Uh, so to to understand what I was looking at on the board, not just like where the pieces are. Oh, I noticed the knight is on a, a black square towards the middle of the board to understand that there's these different abstract concepts uh, that I can filter what I'm looking at through uh, really helped me. 
Uh, I don't know if this is maybe the best or or most perfect version or iteration of like what abstract concepts you should bring to a chessboard. Uh, like for just for an example, he brings up time as one of his uh, principles. And pr time has a lot of overlap with force because in force, he talks about where the pieces are. And in time, he talks about how long it takes for pieces to get to certain places of the board. So I don't know how important that is to make that distinction. Uh, but there was a, a little bit of confusion for me. Yeah. And again, that's sort of one of my quibbles. And, you know, some of the, the things I prefer were probably written subsequently to his book being written in 1992. Um, but we should probably first define his definition for each of these things. So force he describes as the strength of the pieces, either individually or in groups. So roughly, you know, <laughs> you could roughly translate it as what we often think of as material, except as Yasser points out, you can have an advantage in force in just one sector of the board, a just critical sector of the board. Whereas when you talk about material, you usually don't think about it in that way. As Sam said, time, he, he defines as a situation in which you can bring your pieces to a particular part of the board faster than your opponent can. So like he said, some overlap there. Space, when you have more space, you control more territory than your opponent. And pawn structure, the health and positioning of the pawns. Um, so for me, my background teaching, I generally prefer to teach chess as based on three precepts, which are material, king safety, and activity. So the fact that Yasser to me doesn't like emphasize king safety as much in particular, like the material and activity, you might just say, okay, you're quibbling about vocabulary. But to me, like the, the fundamental you know, the object of the game is to checkmate the king. And it's so important to take mm -hmm. care of the king that to me, like that has to be an overarching theme. And obviously it feels a little silly that I'm sitting here like critiquing, uh, yes, or Sarawan, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but when we're talking about like how to, how to teach chess to someone new to the game, I do feel like I'm on relatively equal footing. Whereas if, uh, we were playing a game, he would, uh, mop the floor with me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, so that's a, a minor quibble with it, but, I mean, overall, I do think he's got a lot of he does a good job explaining his um, his ideas and he presents a lot of good examples. So, um, again, just just a minor quibble. And I would, you know, rate this book above many, just not at the tip top. But let's get into it. I mean, there's we both have things we like and dislike about this book. So, Sam, what what is one thing you really liked about this book? Uh one thing that I really took away uh, from this book, one of the biggest and uh, most helpful takeaways for me was the heuristics that he sort of uh, put forward. Um, it, you can pick them out here and there. Sometimes they're scattered like in the middle of a chapter. Uh, but it sort of reminded me, uh, I wrote down in my notes, uh, it's like a dramatic flashback from an 80s movie uh, where the protagonist remembers the lesson of a wise old master. Like, if you only remember one thing, remember this. And and a lot of times, that's all you can remember in the heat of a moment over the board. Um, uh, so one example of that that he has is sooner or later, you will find yourself squeezed by your opponent into a cramped position. So you need to know how to defend against such a tactic. Remember the following principle. The player with less space should try and trade some pieces. And that, that's so simple that uh, you can just like put that in your back pocket and keep it with you at all times. And you're not going to make grandmaster if that's how you like the only thing you have in your in your toolbox. But it certainly can help you out of a bind if you're uh, a novice or intermediate or beginner player. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And he's got some other good ones relating to like, don't play hope chess. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he phrases it a little bit differently, but he, he does provide useful heuristics. And I, again, I, he's got a very, <clears throat> excuse me, he's got a very relatable, readable mm -hmm. style, but he's also not afraid to just like tell you how things should be in mm -hmm. certain circumstances. Um, I did want to, he's a very good writer as we both already mentioned. So I did want to read a paragraph from uh, the intro. And one of my favorite things about this book is um, the, the historical, um, the chess history that he weaves in and a bit of a sort of broader sweep of the world at large as you'll hear in this, this paragraph. So Yasser writes, um, 
Chess is played around the globe by millions of enthusiasts. Unlike other sports, chess is constant. Whether on the beaches of Brazil, beneath the Great Wall of China, or at a Texas barbecue, the game is played the same. Same movements, same rules. Chess has a language of its own. And since I began playing chess, I've made dozens of friends communicating with them through the pieces and squares. Because the necessary equipment is inexpensive, chess has been called the most democratic of games. It crosses many boundaries, race, class, caste, sex, culture, religion, and so on. It is played by people from all walks of life, and it is played by those who can't walk. My first teacher, David Chapman, was a paraplegic. Blind singer and pianist Ray Charles admits that chess is his passion. You don't have to be seven feet tall, as quick as Carl Lewis, or as strong as Mike Tyson to play chess. All you have to do is think. And that last um, little bit of that paragraph is I, I noted is my my favorite quote from the book. I, uh, his love of chess, and his desire to to share it and spread it with people, uh, is so infectious. Uh, and I think that's one of the main things that comes across from the book. Yeah, I agree. And that paragraph, like, you know, it's it like encapsulates so much of what I think appeals to people who like chess about chess. I mean, it's got, uh, I mean, the rich history, the global appeal, um, you know, as he says, in theory, at least the level playing field, I'd say at least the relatively level playing field, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt if the difference between being able to afford a coach and not and stuff like that and travel to tournaments. But in the internet age, you can certainly learn, you can go a long way in chess, just, uh, sitting at your computer using stuff for free. Um, so yeah, just, just an excellent, um, overview of, of what there is to like about chess. And then he's, he's really good at putting himself in beginner's shoes and understanding, uh, what it is that, you know, how a beginner might approach the game, but he's also got a lot of historical nuggets. And I'm curious if he already knew all this stuff or not, because, um, he really goes, you know, goes deep on, uh, on the history dating back to the origins of chess and like the origins of all the chess pieces and, um, uh, you know, Sam or I could definitely share a few examples of that. Um, Sam, yeah. did anything strike you in that regard? Yeah, one of the most mind-boggling things that I read in this book was uh, this excerpt. We know that chess existed in India at the beginning of the 7th century, and we have evidence that a form of chess existed in Central Asia in the 1st century. Some people claim that the game might date back as far as the 15th century BC. Nobody knows exactly how old chess is. And that sense of... Uh, like mysticism and arcane, like things that can't be known. Uh, it's just, it, it's so intriguing to me. And it's, it, it feels like it fits so well with the game of chess. Um, I, it's, it's just incredible to read that type of stuff as someone who's a, a fan of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I know a decent amount of chess history and there's definitely some nuggets I did not know about like etymology of peace names and stuff. Um, here's another quote from Yasser. He writes, uh, more than 1400 years ago in the original Indian game of Chaturanga, the queen was the weakest piece. It's moves being limited to four squares diagonally adjacent to the square the queen was sitting on. At that time, the piece was not known as the queen, but rather as the mantri, which in English means advisor to the king. When the game spread to Persia, the mantri became the Furzan, which means wise man. In Europe, the name was never translated literally. From the early days, the piece was known as the lady, the, the dama in Spanish. Because Europeans thought it natural for a king to have a consort, in many countries, the lady became the queen. So just pack with information. And as someone who, again, when he's like showing the how the rook moves with the lines going up and horizontal, like that didn't grab me as much um, as as these historical nuggets. So it really uh, kept me going. And the book's a quick read. I mean, you could yeah. probably read it in like, you know, do you, how long did it take you to read when you first read it, Sam? Do you know? Um, took me about maybe a week to get through. Uh, but if you're just bustling through it and you don't have much to do, you could get through it in, in a weekend, I mean, in a day if you set your mind to it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then, of course, there are um, some illustrative games that he does a good job annotating towards the end. So obviously those like you might if you read the book quickly, you might come back to those. Yeah. Um, some something I like within the format is that he's got quizzes throughout the book. Um, yeah. So it's you know, it's good to um, to uh, assimilate the knowledge. So did you have any Sam um, like uh, any like. Uh, um, epiphanies from like did and do you remember anything that you were just blown away when you read in particular from this i know it's been a while since you first read it 
Um, I remember specifically the first time. Uh, so the example games he shows are mostly from popular openings that like opening traps or or openings that are very prevalent at the beginner level. And there's one, uh, I forget the name of the mate, uh, but it ends with this beautiful smothered mate. And it was the first time I had ever seen a smothered checkmate. Oh, wow. I was like, oh my God, what is, I, it blew my mind. And, um, and as a new player like that, that's what like makes you fall in love with, uh, with a hobby or a sport uh, is those uh, little wow moments that stick with you. And this, uh, this book as a beginner, there was chalked full of them. Yeah. Again. Yeah. The history, the examples are pretty good. Um, the, there's, there's a lot to like about the book. One, one concern I had, Sam, and uh, I'm not sure you entirely agree with me on this is I felt like sometime it kind of escalated quickly, like both in terms of like the fact that the book starts assuming you don't even know how the pieces move, although you might say, okay, you could easily skip that part. So that doesn't really uh, mean that much. Um, and then it's showing some some more example, some more advanced concepts, you know, like the idea that you want to, if you're attacking a weak pawn, you want to control the square in front of it. You know, like that is a good guideline for sure. But if you just learned how to play chess, that's kind of the least of your concerns, in, in my opinion. Um, and then like when he gives examples of pins, I felt like, like, you know, again, as a chess teacher, I, I come from a background where like, if you look at something like the chess steps, you know, when they, the Dutch uh, curriculum that we has been discussed on the podcast many times, like when they introduce the concept of the pin, they're like beating you over the head with it and showing you like, very slow development, starting with the most simple example and just building it up really slowly. Now, obviously, it's going to be a bigger endeavor than reading the book in a week to study it. But, you know, with Yasser, he's giving a couple examples of the pin. And then before you know it, it's like a, a, a puzzle where a piece is pinned to a back rank mate. So yeah. it's not it's not even pinned to a piece. You know, it's like if you attack the knight and the knight can't cover the back rank and if it moves, it's checkmate. So. I don't know. Like, again, my teacher's perspective, my long experience with chess, I definitely found myself quibbling with that. Um, did that sort of thing, did it even like cross your radar? Did you, when you were reading it, Sam, did you feel like he was going fast? So um, when I, when I first read it, uh, I, I probably had a more, more difficult time and looking at it with a, a, a cynical eye, I definitely could see uh, he goes from having just a, a a pawn on the board and showing arrows of which direction the pawn moves, and perhaps in the next diagram showing uh, the four moves into an opening with every piece still on the board and showing how like a pin in the Italian or something like that can be like uh, implemented and how it can be countered. Uh, it definitely. Uh, for someone who it is who is starting chess, that's their second or third day with a board. Uh, I definitely think it could be easier if they just started with um, two pieces on the board, a king, a bishop, and a pawn. You know. Yeah, yeah. You just want things to be uh, as simple as possible, but not simpler. You know, just show yeah. the bare essentials in order to really sort of isolate um, what it is that, that they're trying to teach. Um, another, another point that I highlighted was this idea of space, which again, I'm, I mentioned, I mean, overall, I just feel like space is very important, you know, shout out Neil Bruce. He's, he's, you know, on his grind and like the more he develops, the more he's, he's saying like, you know, he's, he's around 1800 and he's saying like players at his level still don't appreciate how important space is. And I, I, I suspect that that's true, but that's already at the 1800 level. I don't know. Like uh, you have in our outline somewhere, Sam, that a lot of people say like you found it a problem that a lot of beginners books are just like, you know, don't hang your pieces, you know, and do yeah. a lot of tactics and I get that, but on the other hand, I do I do feel like that's what decides the games. So mm -hmm. it's like a push and pull. So do you, do you have have more to say about that? Like you had encountered that advice uh, about um, what like those bare essentials a lot. I gather, Sam. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say it's it's uh, once you get beyond the don't give up pieces for free, and if your opponent gives you a piece for free, take it. Uh, if you're not at a stage in the game where that's occurring, or if you're 
perhaps uh, getting closer to the thousand uh, a thousand uh, MMR versus uh, five hundred Elo. Um, it's you'll be sitting in a board, and I put down especially in closed positions uh, where there's just simply you simply can't find a plan where the plan had been okay. My pieces are defended. Their pieces are defended. Uh, what do I want to do? I can't check. I don't have mate in one. So I guess I can uh, develop a piece or I can move my knight here because then he won't be able, I control these two squares that like the action of counting the space itself is uh, an exercise that in a longer format game, I found incredibly useful in uh, maybe not yet, not as to go as far as to say is prophylaxis, but uh, just taking away options. Like he talks about in the book that Capablanca, almost like a boa constrictor, would slowly uh, take away his opponent's options and trade down and just win an endgame. Um, I, I found that example very helpful in the idea of, oh, I don't have to just uh, find some quick checkmate. I can take away my opponent's options, leave myself more options. Um, so yeah. in, th in that sense, it helped. Yeah, that makes sense. And he does provide, you mentioned the helpful heuristics. He's got this idea called a space count, which is mm -hmm. um honestly, I had to read it more than once to to make sure <laughs> yeah. to make sure I understood. And I'm like, you know, checking the counts and like, you know, double checking and I'm like, well, I still got the wrong number. I must be doing yeah. this wrong. But the basic idea is how many pieces can uh how many pieces pass the fifth rank, pass midfield if you're white? Like, how many squares can your pieces go to? And if you're black, how many squares can your opponent go to? But it's a bit of a blunt instrument, you know? Like, he counts when, um, you know, if a bishop can go to b5 and a knight can also go to b5, like, he counts it twice, twice you know? Yeah. Like, which is a, a bit odd, you know? So I wanted to share um, a, another sort of fun fact that I learned. Again, he's really good on, like, the etymology and the history and just sort of dropping it in on a um, in a readable style. So... Here's a quote he had about stalemate. He said, uh, though a stalemate has been regarded as a draw since the early 19th century in England in the 17th and 18th centuries, it counted as a, quote, inferior win. In Middle English, the word stale meant imitation. So stalemate meant imitation mate. Modern English language defines the stalemate as a temporary state of impasse. But in chess, there's nothing temporary about it. Stalemate ends the game. So he ties it together nicely. He gives me this little history lesson about stalemate. And there's definitely like, there's tons of stuff like that sprinkled throughout the book. I definitely like, I have a lot of highlights in the book. There's there's a lot of stuff I liked, but definitely um, a few quibbles as well. Um, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, going back to um, uh, talking about that, setting up a, a plan and, and things he does well, uh, with his writing style is, uh, when going through the, the example book, uh, the example games where he lays out what a pin is, um, what a back rank checkmate is, uh, he does an excellent job of each individual move explaining like one E4, why E4, what does this do for white? Uh, it opens your Bishop. It opens your queen, uh, as someone who's a week into playing chess, that might not be something that even occurs to you. You might, a lot of new players uh, that I played against when I first started playing only push the flank pawns because they somehow felt that extending their flank pawns was safer in a way that pawns in the middle could be attacked and, and him presenting the, these classical openings and discussing why they make sense, why each move makes sense for both sides uh, was, was invaluable. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And Sam, let me ask you, so you're kind of, you're like in the chess vortex, you know, you yeah. discover chess, you're like, all right, let's go. You know, you're watching yeah. videos, you're reading books. Mm -hmm. um, so when you pick up this book, and I'm sure it's not being done in isolation, you're also probably playing some online, watching some mm -hmm. videos. So how did you compare how this information is presented to your other sort of uh, chess information um, ingestion experiences at that time? So um, the other main source of chess information that I had over the last uh, year was definitely Hanging Pong, Hanging Pawns. Uh, I love his YouTube channel. The way he lays stuff out is incredibly helpful. Um, but for somebody at my level, a, a lot of it is uh, 
I found helpful in theory and not at all in practice because uh, we don't get eight moves into the fantasy variation of the Carol Khan ever. Yeah. Uh, So uh, knowing what to do, how to formulate a plan, uh, knowing why, okay, my opponent played H6. Oh, he was supposed to play D D5. What am I supposed to do now? Uh, Knowing my plan helps me uh, continue uh, with through my game. Yeah, that's interesting. Shout out to Stiep and Hanging Pawns, of course. I'm, I've mentioned many times, I'm a mm-hmm. big fan of his uh, his opening videos in particular, but I do find it funny that great. like, yeah, but it's funny that like someone brand new to chess, like at some point the algorithm fed you Stiep and suddenly, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like you gravitate towards the, like you, you like his presentation style, maybe as oh, I yeah. told, as I told him years ago when I interviewed him, he's got the, the beautiful thumbnails, the thumbnails, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, it's like, it's like these, again, these sort of, um, sort of random factors lead you to watching, uh, a, you know, a presenter who's probably not like perfect for your level. Um, because yeah, with, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, you could do like a climbing the rating ladder, starting at a very low rating, you know, from like Naroditsky or John Bartholomew or someone mm-hmm. like that, or the like beginner Those to master series helpful. by, um, chess network, you know, there, there is stuff out there, you know, that's sort of like grassroots from, from the, you know, from the bottom, mm-hmm. but, uh, but you've got to find it and that can be yeah. daunting. Whereas if you look for a beginner chess book, you know, you should get fed something that's a beginner chess book, you know? So in a sense, you're, you're more likely to find something at your level when it's a book and, uh, and you did, and it helped you. Um, yeah. And the, the, the videos that I found that helped me the absolute most were those, uh, um, speed runs, whatever you want to call them yeah. from, uh, from Daniel Naroditsky and, uh, uh, John Bartholomew, put out a few videos uh, five, six years ago, uh, going through things like uh, undefended pieces. Yeah. And those were unbelievably helpful, the way he lays out and talks through his his thought process. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like, I think he calls it, I think it's a playlist called Chess Fundamentals. Yeah. yeah. And just like evergreen material. So good. Um, cool. All right. Well, Sam, we need to take one more break and then we're going to share a few improvement highlights and uh, and think about wrapping things up pretty soon. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. My latest discovery on aimchess.com is in addition to its algorithm generating statistics and telling you trends from your opening games, there's a tab at the top where you can go to game history and review individual games and it tags recurring issues. So for example, it keeps telling me I had good openings, but it also tells me when I was behind on the clock, when I failed to convert an advantage. So you can then within the aim chess platform, review the game and look for uh, leaks that you need to plug things to correct. So one of the many ways you can use aimchess.com to improve your game. So you can check it out for free. And if you choose to subscribe, use the code perpetual 30 to save 30%, or you can also use the link on aimchess.com that is provided in the show description. And we are back and I highlighted some tips that we could share. You know, if you guys have made it in this far in this podcast, you might might be looking for a few tips. So I'd share a few things that resonated with me. But before we do that, like uh, just sort of broader theme, did you have any other observations or likes or dislikes that you wanted to highlight, Sam? Uh, one of the biggest things that I took from this book and that I've taken from like the chess, uh, chess bra as well, uh, is to find what you enjoy, uh, and study that, uh, whether, even if it's not the most efficient thing, uh, in, in all, in all likelihood, you're not going to become a grandmaster. You're not going to become the world champion chess at the end of the day for most of us is a hobby and hobbies are meant to be, uh, enjoyed. And if you're improving at a slower rate because you're studying and, only end games or only openings that you're interested in, uh, you know, that's fine. Uh, in in my opinion, I I think that's sort of what is put forth, not to speak for him, uh, but from Yasser in this book is, uh, finding like what you're passionate about in the game of chess itself, whether it be the history of it or, um, the history of openings and that anything. Yeah, no, well said. And as we've mentioned, I mean, his enthusiasm really shines through. I mean, yeah. grabbing you right from right from that introduction where we shared a, a quote. Um, and that's kind of the most important thing, you know, like they say, like when you're in college, you know, pick your professors 
uh, based on which professors you like, not like which are the best teachers, not what the best subject is, you know, and and there's there's an element of that in terms of like just the sheer enthusiasm. And again, you discovering Yasser online, that's why you uh, gravitated towards this book. And that's why, like, I still, again, quibbles with the way the chess is taught nonwithstanding. I found the book uh, eminently readable and uh, and enjoyed it. Um so a few improvement things that I would highlight if you are newer to chess and looking for a few or a uh, chess teacher looking to uh, brush up on um, what to what to impart to your students. Um, number one, he's got a good quote about, you know, he, he shows an example. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the classic example of hope chess where you play a move that's bad if your opponent knows what you're doing, um, but otherwise is good. And Sam, would would you like to read that quote about uh, playing for traps? Yeah. Uh, Don't play for traps. Always make moves that deploy your men in a way that helps your position generally. Never play a move that puts you in either of the following emotionally charged situations. A, your opponent doesn't see your trap and loses horribly. B, he sees your trap and counters in such a way that your position falls apart. I'm not saying you shouldn't lay a trap only that you should be sure that your position won't be compromised if your opponent avoids the trap. Yeah, pretty well said. And again, the fact that he describes that situation as emotionally charged, that to me sort of, that shows the sort of empathy that you might not expect from an absolutely world-class player, that he can remember that feeling of like, you know, you play this move and you're like, oh, I hope they don't see it. I hope they don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that that I felt was, was uh, useful advice. Um Sam, what else did you like when you you've already shared one or two examples, but what else mm-hmm. when you when you read this book where you're like, all right, now I have a handle on this or or again, you mentioned heuristics. If there's another heuristic that sort of stuck with you. Um, so the two biggest things that I took from this book that added to my confidence as a player uh, and really uh, helped me shoot up hundreds of rating points in a matter of months was uh, getting to know the basic tactics in and out that he presents being the pin fork and discovered attack uh, knowing how to use them and avoid them and not just like knowing of them knowing them so well that when you're calculating even just one or two moves in advance you can like see them uh, uh, in in your basic calculation uh, and the other being knowing the basic end games of king and queen versus king and king and rook versus king uh, i remember getting uh finally getting how to checkmate with just the king and a rook i kept on doing the chess.com drill over and over again until i finally figured it out and that gave me such a boost in confidence uh, because i previously had felt that i had the end of the game in the middle game otherwise it would just be a draw um and so that was invaluable yeah yeah, that's huge. And in terms of the book being outdated, that was another. It's good that you mentioned the chess.com drills because that was another thing that I highlighted where like it he, you know, he does a good job explaining them, but and there are lots of things you can still learn for chess books, but when it comes to basic mates, like you clearly should be learning it on a computer. Mm-hmm. Um and obviously there there's chessable for that if you got the chessable version of this. Uh there's the chess.com drills as you mentioned, but that's one where like A, you have to know it and B like just the the AI of being able to practice that against a computer is just like leaps and bounds better than reading about it. Whereas if you're learning about a sort of squishy or positional concept or going over a game, to me, a book definitely still has a place. But but yeah, but anyway, that's not a knock on on Yasser. And as you mentioned, uh, Sam, like you were able to weave them together, like you learned the concept from the book and then practiced online, which is kind of mm-hmm. like the best of both worlds. Um, I liked another uh, highlight that I liked was um, where he he does a little sort of um, soliloquy against uh, memorizing openings and tells a story <laughs> of like a game from when he was a kid and someone ever, you know, lots of people have stories like this. They, they play 12, 13 perfect moves and then just start like hanging all their pieces as soon as they don't remember oh, a yes. move. So he says, uh, take my word for it. A good memory is useful, but without a firm knowledge of chess fundamentals, you are doomed to constant defeat. Um, so succinct and spot on. So, uh, shout out to Yasser as always. Um, anything else we should highlight as sort of a, uh, improvement, um, must know, Sam must remember. Uh, just that he also says, if you're a beginner, never resign, uh, 
your opponent may have been like myself and not know how to checkmate you even with a king and a queen uh you know as eric rosen does you can swindle your way out of it into a stalemate uh but uh yeah what, what he talks about with the openings not memorizing them that resonates so strongly with me which is why i have such appreciation for him explaining every move from the sample games that he presents yeah yeah well said and definitely good advice i mean you will occasionally come across people telling you you should resign but i mean there's as you as you said eric's the perfect example so many stalemate possibilities um so uh, i think it's it's good advice although it does get confusing when you're watching high level games and they always resign and then you're, <laughs> you're like wait but, but i shouldn't do that yeah um so yeah, lots to learn from this book, of course. One other last highlight I wanted to mention was he goes over the concept of closed positions and presents some examples, but then he asks, uh, so he writes, so which do I recommend for the beginning player, closed or open positions? Open positions by all means. The type of game produced by open positions will teach you about timing and will introduce you to the tactics necessary to deal with the lack of development and an exposed king. In general, closed positions are played more effectively by players with several years' experience under their belts. So, again, great point, although that does get me back to my quibble because sort of when he's talking about space and stuff, I did feel like he's kind of tilting towards things that require more experience to understand. Um, but anyway, I would give this book like a B plus or something like that, maybe a B. Um uh, and, and this is ranking it, you know, for people new to chess, people who either don't know how to play or, um, y- you know, just know the bare essentials. Uh, so, Sam, I'm guessing you're you're coming in higher. I do consider Sam more qualified to judge this because he's <laughs> the target audience and I'm just sort of parachuting in. But so for Sam, what what grade would you give this? I, I'd put it firmly at a A minus where uh In all likelihood, there is a better book somewhere, but if this is the book you have, it will get you where you're trying to go. Um, It will get you from being a beginner to firmly uh, intermediate player with a good understanding of the game. Uh, uh, (laughs) An adequate understanding of the game, I should say. (laughs) Okay, yeah, and and I don't disagree with that. Um, So a couple books that I do like better um num- and i've you know i've recommended these before um learn to play chess like a boss by uh grandmaster patrick wolf um used to be called the complete idiot's guide to chess and now they updated it it's a much <laughs> bigger endeavor um you know it's like uh you know hundreds and hundreds of pages it would take you a lot longer to read but unlike this book they also update it constantly so like he writes about computers in the modern age um so it starts just as slow but it 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 goes through the tactics i mean it's almost like you know yasser obviously ended up writing seven books in this series and it's almost like those seven books combined but i just i'm a big fan of the way that the series is presented um number two Uh, Winning Chess Strategy for Kids by Jeff Coakley. As Neil Bruce has said, it doesn't just have to be for kids, um, but uh, it does help if it's for, um, I mean, if it's, you know, there are cartoons in it, let's be real. So, you know, that that may or may not bother you. But in terms of like the explanation of concepts, I I, I think that book's amazing. And definitely for teacher, any scholastic teachers, um, the book's a little pricey, but it's an absolute uh, must have. Of course, there's the chess step series, which is not going to give you as much positional concepts, but I still feel like from, from the ground up, it's, it's a great way to go and make sure if you're teaching kids, you get the stepping stones ones. Uh, if you're teaching, um, kids who are new to chess in terms of game collections, you know, like Sam, of course, mentioned that part of the reason this book really resonated with him was the illustrative games. Of course, we did do a podcast on First Book of Morphe, um, a a book I also have some quibbles with. But I would say um, First Book of Morphe, I I think if you were only going to read one or then the other, I feel like you would have a firmer grasp on chess fundamentals from First Book of Morphe um, than this one. Although um, I prefer Yasser's reading style to to the first i mean writing style to the the first book of morphe author um so again this book is very good it's just there's a few that i like better um so 
Um, any closing words on the book, Sam, before we do a little, a, a bit of a uh, book recap housekeeping? Um, I highly recommend it. I, I highly recommend it that if you pick it up and play through it, that you do it with a board. Uh, when I first picked it up a year and a half ago, I just skipped those sections thinking that it would be uh, not, not required material. Uh, but it definitely, that is where the meat of it is. Uh, so cool. I recommend you check it out. And in your your chess journey so far, Sam, are there any other books that have really resonated with you? Uh, the two that I liked the most that I picked up was uh, were uh, five thousand three hundred thirty one puzzles, uh, the book by Polgar. Yeah. Uh, before that, I never realized that when doing a chess puzzle, you weren't just supposed to guess and hope you got <laughs> it right. Right. Um, and the other being um, my first chess opening repertoire for White. Uh, it's an excellent short read. It gives you an entire, uh, opening repertoire. If that's what you are dead set on learning first, uh, it's gives classical open position openings, uh, and responses to, it starts with E4 and has a response to every possible response from black, um, well-written, uh, highly recommended. Okay, excellent. So yeah, for any listeners uh, in a similar stage of their journey as Sam, be sure to check those out. And I do have a lot of experience um, with the Polgar book, and it's definitely a great tactics book that will keep you busy for a very long time. Um, so can can second that recommendation as well. Well, Sam, you've been great. I want to thank you. Um, and, uh, I'd like, if you have a, a chess cause that I could help support a little bit, I'd be happy to do so. Do you have a preferred chess cause? I do. Uh, it's called chess for freedom. Uh, it's a branch of FIDE that's partnered with the Cook County jail, uh, to help spread and promote chess games between inmates, uh, and also between inmates and their children over Skype. Um, and they just got back to me. I, I am able to a semi donation to them and I'm hoping to volunteer with them as well. Awesome. Great to hear, man. Um, cool. And are you, I don't know if you want to share any info like uh, your handle on the chess sites or anything like that, but uh, if anyone wants to to play a game with you, is there a way for them to do that? Uh, yeah. On, on chess.com, it's just Sam Robs, S-A-M-R-O-B-S. Uh, and if you want to get in contact with me for any reason uh on twitter it's uh, sam underscore robs okay awesome well thanks sam and one last thing to mention listeners i do uh have the next um book recap lined up um we're gonna do a book called chess tactics from scratch i believe john bartholomew recommended it way back in the day i know the the guys over at chess dojo are a fan. So Steve from Boston, shout out to Steve, is going to be helping me out with that. Um, It's a quality chess book. I have no real prior knowledge of it, so I'll be digging in. Uh, The plan is to get that out in late July, Um, but it's a big book, so we'll see what happens. But that's uh, definitely plan A, and it's definitely uh, what's coming next. Um, So thanks again, Sam. It's been been fun getting to chat some chess with you, and uh, good luck with um, your continued chess and life. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me on. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.